Yeah, so the main goal of my talk is to give students and postdocs and younger mathematicians uh, the idea that Macaulay too is something both rewarding to get into and something that is possible to get into and that there's some help available and that there's some professional opportunities available for you. So we have a website at macaulay2.com and there are links to various places. And the first one I want to point out is the link to the journal of software um, for algebra and geometry, which um, is a journal we started a few years to provide a forum for publications having to do with accomplishments in the area of algorithm development and code writing, initially just for Macaulay too, but now also for Gap and Singular. And uh, Greg Smith and Amelia Taylor are the managing editors for us, and Greg Smith is here, so you can talk to him about that. But the idea of the journal is that, um, yeah, let's go to the contents page. There have been six volumes already, and you can see that there are very, various articles here that have been published. And so far, every single article corresponds to some code that somebody has written and packaged together for others to use, so along with documentation. And the article is a traditional mathematical article, article written in five to seven pages that explains what the code is about, what the code does, how to use the code, and what the algorithms are behind it, and whether they're new, and so on. And so if you um, go to that website yourself, you can click on the, um, you click on one of the articles and read the abstract and then download the paper. Um, let's see. Oh yeah, here's the PDF file up here. So click on that to get the PDF file. And then also the source code of the package is here. But also, in addition to that, all of the source code that goes into all of these articles becomes a permanent part of the Macaulay 2 distribution. And so everybody who downloads Macaulay 2 gets all of the packages that are described in these articles. So um, what do I mean by package? Well, Macaulay 2 has um, some part of the built-in software of it is devoted to organizing software in some sort of documentable unit that we call a package. And there are examples of how to write these packages. And when I switch over to looking at code, I'll show you some of that. Um, and in fact, the packages um, are detailed here in the download section. There are these various packages. And there are the names of them. And the ones with the gold stars are the ones that have been certified as having been reviewed and corresponding articles been accepted in the journal. And then if you click on one of those packages, you get to the documentation page for the package. And oh, there should be a gold star here. The link is broken. Um, that's strange. Um, but you get, and I thought the background should be in color too. Oh, I think it's missing the style file. That's the problem. Where is, where are you? Oh, you're I, the yeah, well, you know, with the release of 1.7 that happened a couple of weeks ago, I put, I re supplanted the old documentation from 1.6 with the new documentation for 1.7. So it looks like I left something out. But in any case, um, this one has been, um, certified as having been published in volume one of the journal. And uh, it tells you which version was published. And then, you know, we keep the thing working for you because it's part of our source code distribution. And as changes to Macaulay 2 happen, we update the thing. And so even if you haven't yet published or you don't ever intend to publish, you can submit your package to become a part of Macaulay 2. And um, I'll show you a little bit about how to do that with Git. And if you submit your package to become part of Macaulay 2, we'll maintain it and keep it running. And uh, uh, of course, you should include 
a test suite so that we know whether your package is continuing to run. So, um, so what about getting started with Macaulay 2? Well, there is a section here called getting started and you can see some interactive sessions, you can see some expositions how a, a, a new person to Macaulay 2 might get started. These four things uh, portray, it presents some of the common basic modes of using Macaulay 2. And then if you have questions, one of the valuable things is our Google discussion group where there are plenty of people online who are willing to answer your questions. Oh, and there are three pending messages to review for me. <laughs> I've not been getting emails about those, or else I decided they were spam. <laughs> um, but the, yeah, so there will be no spam. But you see, there are various um, questions asked, and then a various number of replies have been provided, and so you can get help. So what else do I want to show? Um, well, actually the software libraries are, are sort of interesting. One of the aspects of Macaulay 2 is that it's some sort of umbrella for the incorporation of a lot of code written by others, uh, software libraries. And we call upon these software libraries for various things. Maybe not things that have to do with every user, but for example, MPFR is the package that does um, arbitrary precision floating point arithmetic. Um, that's, I think, Anton, I think you're actually using that. So that is relevant for the numerical code. And um, it, so in some sense, being an umbrella like this, Macaulay 2 is able to provide lots of facilities without us having to implement the algorithms ourselves. We just include them. And then events are advertised, and like this one is advertised. And then here's another great feature, which I didn't plan to mention, but which I see we have. This is tr try it out. And so there are two ways to try it out. You can try it out under the Sage Math Cloud, or you can try our, our own um, cloud version of Macaulay 2, which um, was recently, well, within the last couple of years, implemented. So even if you haven't succeeded in, in installing it on your machine, you can just go there and try it out, and your session will be maintained for Ever, Mike, or um, oh, yeah. until you get no, no, tired? It, um, so it, at the moment, it lasts for a few days or something like that. Yeah. All right. <laughs> it, so it's a big machine with lots of RAM, so you can do real computations there. And you can consume a lot of CPU time there without fear that anyone will yell at you. So well, please. Let's not go overboard. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, there are some limits on it, um, but they're not like really stringent sorts of <laughs> And hopefully installing Macaulay 2 won't be much of a problem. Their download section contains installable compiled versions for various operating systems. Now, with, we've had a little bit of delay getting various binary distributions of version 1.7 out. But for version 1.6, there are lots of different operating systems available. And um, for 1.7, so far, there's just the Mac OS X version and the Ubuntu 14.04 version 64-bit. But uh, there are others will be there shortly. Actually, which, which operating system should I do next? Is it, which one, Debian or a, a different version of Ubuntu? Any preference? Can I just stop? Is that enough already? <laughs> Windows. Windows. All right, the problem with Windows uh, is, yeah, the Windows might take a little bit of time. We ran, we ran into a technical issue trying to do it under the 64-bit SIGWIN, which I think is the only version that we'd, is, I think that's the version that's really relevant for people now that computers tend to have more than two gigabytes of RAM. And um, we ran into a technical problem with part of the system software crashing while trying to link our program together. So it's very sad, but I know how to work around it, but it's gonna take some time. 
And, um, but it'll run under Sigwin, not natively under Windows. But that should be OK, because Sigwin gives you an environment that's just like Unix, more or less, except that it's not as good. Um, all right. Oh, and then the documentation is available on the re website, too. So if you are interested in um, by looking up the documentation for some topic, then Google indexes this for us, and uh, you, can, you can find out how to do stuff and see examples of doing it. So, um, so the source code for Macaulay 2 is visible. It's free software. The, it's licensed under the GNU um, public license. It means anyone can copy it and modify it, provided they satisfy certain conditions about not keeping things secret. And um, so you can contribute too. And if you find a feature that needs to be added or you want to add your own code, you can do that. And so the way we suggest doing that is by using the GitHub repository, which is linked to here. Well, sometimes with Mac OS X, the, browsers, the browser stops switching from an eye beam to a, a, a finger when I'm on a link. Anyone know why that is? I usually just have to restart the browser, but I'm not going to take the trouble to do that. So um, here is our source code repository at GitHub. In fact, you don't even have to download the source. If you want to browse the source code and read it, you can do that here over the web. So, um, and then the readme file tells you what Macaulay 2 is and, and gives you some instructions for how to get started. And um, so in particular, there's a link right here for brief instructions about how to use Git. That's from our wiki. And um, there's even an issue tracker where you get to um, put bug reports. So suppose you find a bug, then you click on issues, and you compose an issue, and you submit it. And we get notified by email that someone has submitted a bug. And we take a look at that, and, and we schedule it to be dealt with later. <laughs> Hopefully. Hopefully we deal with it right away. Some of them can be dealt with right away. And, and whenever I think of something that I want to do, I add an issue so I don't forget to do it. And then the great thing about this bug tracker is that you can append annotations like this has to be done by version 1.7. Or you can add an annotation about who gets to do it. So my picture attached there, or Mike's picture, says who's in charge of doing it. And then there's the wiki. I don't know how much is there. There's just that how to use Git thing. But the how to use Git thing is important because this is how you're going to contribute software if you get around to that. So we had a fair number of people earlier this morning who claimed to have already saved some software. Well, just think how wonderful it would be if the software you saved were documented and made available for other people to use. So the way you would do that is by writing a package and contributing it to Macaulay 2. And the way you would contribute to Macaulay 2 is by using this program called Git to, um, and using github.com to first of all create your own so-called fork of our source code repository. After creating an account on GitHub, you're allowed to do that. And so, in fact, I should show you my account. Let me sign in. So if I sign in, and oh, if I click on my name, then you see my page on GitHub. And you see that I have um, some repositories of my own. And one of my repositories is M2. And it says it's been forked from Macaulay 2 slash M2. So what that means is that I have a copy of that in my account. and. I can freely make changes and updates to my copy of that, which is stored on the web at the github.com website. And when I'm ready for those changes to the source code to become part of the official Macaulay 2 distribution, I can easily notify the Macaulay 2 developers of 
my desire by issuing what a so-called pull request. So the way Git works is that you might have you might start out with an identical copy of Macaulay 2 source code repository and Macaulay 2 will continue getting developed and changed and your copy you you will start developing it and changing it and at a certain point you want to merge your changes in to our copy and so you issue what's called a pull request and then we get that and we look at your pull request and we run it to see whether it works and we want to make sure it works because we don't want the source code distribution to break and uh, we put that in and so um, that would be your first step of course, having the source code on the web isn't so great from the point of view of developing it. So then what you want to do is you want to download that source code to your own machine so that you can work on it. And that's what the Git program running on your machine is useful for. If it's not there, you have to install it, but it's available everywhere. And then you do what's called cloning the software. You get a copy on your machine. You have all of our software. And you start changing it as you wish, including by adding your own files. Now, where would you add your own files to add to Macaulay 2? Well, at the top level of Macaulay 2, we see various files and various directories or folders. If you click on M2, that's where the code is. And there are various subdirectories there. The only interesting one now for us is the one called Macaulay 2, where the actual um, code of Macaulay 2 is. And then I might also mention that the library's subdirectory has the code for those, or actually stubs for building and compiling the code for those various libraries that I mentioned to you before. And then also um, submodules has, the co has um, a different kind of hook for another way of incorporating a library. Anyway, Macaulay 2 is where the source code is. And you see what Mike and I have written. And what, um, for example, what Mike has written is, a lot of what Mike has written is written in C++ in the E directory. And that's where the basic algorithms for the um, Gerbner bases and matrices and resolutions are implemented in the C++ language. And then um, in the M2 directory, we actually have implemented lots of uh, mathematics in the Macaulay 2 user language that you saw Mike typing. And actually, this is really a cool feature about the Macaulay 2 language that um, we have written so much of our code for you in the same language that you're going to get to use that the, the language is powerful enough to add new features to the system. And so if you want to add a feature to the system which is just like a feature which is already there or slightly different or something, then you should be able to do that. Are you going to show the um, testers? Thank yeah, you. I'm going to, eventually I'm going to switch to uh, Macaulay 2 and actually show some code. Um, but I wanted to point out first where you would put your code if it's written in the top level Macaulay 2 language. You would put it in the directory called packages. And so here's where all the source code for all those packages is. And um, so, for example, primary decomposition is there. Uh, oh, that's in the directory. Actually, I sh I sh yeah, well, I should have clicked on a file. We have the directories and we have the files. So the file names end with .m2, and then the directories sometimes have the same name without the .m2, and they come as a pair. So the top level file will be the, the one with the .m2 on the end, like codepth3.m2. And then if there's a directory with the name codepth, that's where the other files for the package will be located. And you can put anything there that you want to have. And so, um, there's a little bit of bureaucracy associated with um, having a package. You have to give the name of the package, the version number, the date, who the authors are, a, a, a brief description of what the package does, uh, what other packages are needed by this package. That's what package imports is about. And then this certification block is inserted by us when you publish your um, package in the form of an article in the journal. And then you give the names of the functions or symbols that you want the user to be able to use, and everything else is kept private. 
so that you don't clutter the namespace for the user. And then you implement your code. And so you put as much code in there as you want. And then you begin the documentation section. The purpose of beginning the documentation section is so that later on, when your package is loaded, the documentation can be loaded in a, a quick way. And, and so it, if that doc, documentation is available, loading of this file will end at this point. And then the, you, can, you have to document, in fact, every one of your functions. And so, um, and I think people have been a pretty adept at getting things documented. And when you install the package using the Macaulay 2 to so-called install it, it'll generate the documentation from those instructions in the form of web pages that we've already clicked on. And um, you'll get an error message if you forgot to document something. But then, as I mentioned also, you need to test that your package works so that we can keep it working for you. And um, that's what all these test strings are about. So triple slash is just the beginning of a text string. And the word test means the contents of the string should be interpreted as, as commands later on that should be run to make sure that the thing works. And then an error will be generated if you program it in such a way that an error would be generated if it gave the wrong answer. And if it crashed, of course, an error would be generated too. So, um, so by the way, documenting, doing all this stuff, even on your own package or on your own work for your, your research is useful so that when you come back a few months later, mm -hmm you can actually make sure that it works correctly. You can look at what it is that things were supposed to do. It takes a little bit extra time, but it's really, a, it's, it's actually a pretty good idea. Can I add to that, Mike? Yes. Yeah. It's also very useful to share with collaborators. It's documented. Yes. <laughs> so, I'm not going to actually run any git commands for you. That's um, perhaps not so important. Uh, <clears throat> what else did we want to show? Well, I think that's the, from the web page. Um, So, let me see if that's true. I, I said everything I want to say. Yeah, I think I did. All right, so, um, I th Mike suggested that I present at least one little example of how one tries to write code in uh, Macaulay 2. So the, it, his suggestion was that I show you how to hold a, a tensor in unevaluated form. So this, this is a language issue. You saw that when Mike was typing whatever it was, it was AA star star BB for example, AA and BB were matrices and it did the tensor product. But what if you wanted to, re it computed the tensor product. And so, it, you know, instead of a, a vector of length four and a vector of length five with a tensor product symbol between them that you could look at compactly, you get a single vector of length 20. That's what the computation consists of. But suppose you wanted to hold that in unevaluated form so you could look at the component tensors and then you wanted to evaluate that later to see what it turns out to be. So this is a little programming exercise. So if you play around with Macaulay 2 or read some of those getting started links that I pointed you at, you, you pretty soon um, find the factor function, which factors integers for you, and it returns a, um, a product. And that's a product in unevaluated form. And 
I should mention what's happening on the second output line. Every time you type in input line, the prompt begins with I, and then there are usually, or often, there are two outputs. Both begin with O for output, and one has an equal sign and one has a colon. The equal sign says what the value is equal to, and the colon says what type of thing the value has. So this thing that came out is an expression of class product. So we'll get into that in a second. But let's just peek inside and, and see what we see. What we see is that um, there's the word product, which has already been advertised to be the class of the thing. And then there are some numbers. And actually, those are not exactly numbers. 2 squared, for example, is also in unevaluated form. But we're interested in just products now. We're going to think of them as tensor products. But it turns out, if you read the documentation, you can find that for um, product, um, it's really a, a type of list. And so you can make a product from a list. And there's how you make one from scratch. New product from a list, and then you, it displays like that. So the, it's really just a list together with an indication in its class about how to display it. I want to give you the feeling that you can do this too. You can invent new classes of object, and you can invent new mechanisms for displaying them. I won't go into details too much about how to do that, though. But suppose we make a ring, and we make a free module over the ring. Um, and then we take, oh, I should show what M1, M2, and M3 are. Maybe I won't need that chair, but it can stay here. It can stay here. That's we can also put the button on the screen. Oh, yeah, let's put it on the stage. That'd be really cool. <laughs> oh, that's a lot better. <laughs> it's in the right height for a podium suddenly. <laughs> um, so M is a free module. It's R to the 4. And um, the subscript picks out one of the generators. So it, indexing, as Mike says, starts with 0. And there, so we get these various things. And these things are, if you look at the colon output line, these are things of class R to the 4. So these are vectors in the, or elements of the free module. And if we um, make a product from three vectors, well, it looks sort of cool. Just right there, we have um, a displayed product uh, in unevaluated form. We're thinking of it as the tensor product. But at least it displays with the, th the three components. And um, you know, I could uh, multiply that by 2, and it would be 2 times that. And I could add that to um, that, and it keeps building up these formal expressions for us in unevaluated form. So, um, but what about getting the value finally? Well, with factoring, when after you factor a number, if you read the documentation, you can and read it very carefully with an eagle eye, you will discern that there's a function called value that releases the thing and gets the thing evaluated back as uh, out and computes the value. And so that's what we want to implement next. We want to get that to work. Does it work already? Um, let's try it. No, it didn't work already. So don't be afraid to make things not work. You can always debug them. There's a built-in debugger. And hopefully the error messages say something informative. So when you see an error message, um, resist the temptation to do something else, but actually read the error message and see whether it tells you something. And in this case, it says no method for binary operator star applied to objects. So it has that one vector times another vector. Well, of course, vector times vector doesn't normally make sense. In fact, as you saw from Mike's demonstration, it's the double star that makes tensor product, not the single star. But I think we can make use of this thing being undefined. 
um, by defining multiplication of two vectors to be tensor products. Why not? It's an undefined operation so far. We're not going to break something in the system that depends on this operation being undefined. So we can just bravely define a multiplication operation for vectors. But now, how does defining a multiplication operation for vectors work? How does defining operations work in this programming language? Well, when you have a vector like m1, um, I mentioned before that everything has a class, and the class is displayed on that colon output line. Well, there's a function called class which tells you what the class is, so we can use that as a way of examining things. The class, um, as advertised, is R to the 4. But the reason I want to take a look at that a little more closely is to explain how inheritance works in Macaulay 2 language. It's some sort of, it's sort of like an object-oriented programming language where you can have classes being subclasses of other classes. And the algorithms or methods that apply to the larger class will also apply to the subclasses unless they're explicitly overwritten. And so to get to the larger class, we have a function called parent. In this case, the parent of R to the 4 is vector. Let's try a few others. What's the parent of um, QQ to the 11? It's also vector. So every element in a module is first of class that module. That module is a type. It has instances. and then. The parent class, the larger class, is just called vector. And so there are some things that are implemented for vectors and some things that might be Im implemented for just certain types of modules. But we might as well implement tensor product of vectors to work for any two vectors in any two modules. So there's no reason to think that our job now is to implement product of two vectors in R to the 4, because then we won't have done it for R to the 5. Our job now really is to implement multiplication for two vectors. So if you use the function methods, you can get a list of all the methods that apply to vectors. And um, there are a certain number of them. And the first one is tensor product. It has two stars. So that would be the, how you uh, make a tensor product of two vectors. And uh, then there are other ones. And you can get the source code of those, too, if you want to. But I won't show how to do that. Oh, well, but we can get the help. So it turns out that in that list, the symbols, you can't just type them in again. Because if you type star star, it tries to be an operator between two things. So typing symbol allows you to get the symbol as an abstract entity. And then you can get the help for um, star star. So it's the tensor product. And this help is the same thing you would see on the web version of the documentation. It's available inline while running the program with the help command. In fact, if you forget how to do it, or if you need help generally, you could just type help. And it gives you some um, advice about what to do if you're just getting started. So type help. So um, star star is the tensor product operation for vectors. We saw that for matrices in Mike's talk. He wasn't using vectors. Um, and then as I was advertising before, it does the computation out. But we want to leave it in unevaluated form. That's the point of our exercise. So here's what we do. We, um, we define a new method. This is the way you define a new method. You mention a, a type. Types are the sorts of things that are valid as classes of other objects in the system. This will be the method for multiplying a vector times a vector. And you write a colon equal always. This is a different use of the colon equal than Mike explained this morning. And then you put a function that does the job. And the job is to just do v star star w, which is what we wanted to do in the first place. So now, if we um, make one of these formal products unevaluated and take the value, well, then it just works. Oops. So value now works because we've added this method for multiplication of two vectors. 
Um, oh yeah, so I think that's um, the end of my software demo. Um, now, if you wanted to change the display, um, would you change the net command? I mean, what yeah, would... yeah. So you can change the way it displays. So you might. Oh, I keep pressing something. Let's get rid of this junk. Um, so the display looks sort of ugly in some sense. What's happening here is that the slash and the vertical bars and the slash in the leftmost column are my simulation of what a left parenthesis looks like in ASCII art form. And then you see some ASCII art right parentheses also, and then those parenthesized things are adjacent to each other. But maybe it would be nicer if you had no parentheses and you just put a double star between the vectors. Suppose that's your assignment. Well, then you could do that. There's, you would override the method for creating this ASCII art. So the function in Macaulay 2 for taking a mathematical object and creating an ASCII art two-dimensional representation of it is called net. The idea is that a string is a horizontal sequence of letters, and a net is a two-dimensional sequence of letters. And it's sort of optimized so that the, the rows can have different lengths, and the thing can float above or below the baseline like a box in tech. And so you can play around with that. Here, the baseline for this net is always, in the output, it's always put at the location of the equal sign. But um, you know, you do see superscripts coming out. And like if you type x squared in, then the two, the x comes out on the baseline and two is above. That shows you that these output boxes are like boxes in tech. Um, so, so, can I ask you that? So uh, yeah. I wanted to understand how to use the coefficient command with products and sums of products. Is this to do a, what exactly? Well, I want to like have a, a formal sum of classes of products, and I want to say what the you know one, two, five coefficient of that formal sum is. Oh, right, because these are tensors and they have triple indices, but we're, we just gave a very compact way to express them, and. Sorry. And are you, are you thinking there should be a way of taking one of these unevaluated things and picking out? Oh, yeah. So then what you would want to do, for example, is, um, well, first of all, you might be dissatisfied with this thing being an expression of class product, because that doesn't say it's a product of matrices. And what you're just talking about is something that would only apply to products of matrices. I should have said vectors. You're talking about something that would only apply to products of vectors. I could do it for polynomials as well. If I had a product of two polynomials, I don't want to multiply them all out. I just want to know what the x squared y coefficient is in this product. Of two. Well, then maybe we don't have to introduce a new class to hide our code. But what you would then you could write code where you would define a certain function which accepts an argument of type product, and then when it's an argument of type product, you remember that it's really basically just a list. And you can use the standard features of the Macaulay 2 language to extract the elements of the list one at a time. And then let's say we're talking about three factors in the product. And then you want, say, the ijk coefficient, where i and j and k are to be interpreted in the three factors. And so you would just loop through the list, taking out the ith coefficient from the ith matrix, and then <coughs> multiplying those together, and we turn that sum. But then, it, I mean, if you want to use the feature where um, I mentioned before, you could multiply one of these formal expressions by a scalar, or then maybe add various pure tensors, then you would have to loop over such things. And so if you have a sum, for example, then what does that look like internally? First of all, it's an expression of class sum rather than an expression of class product. But again, an expression, all these expressions are really just types of list. This is just a list to go for the label that you should add the terms. And so if you have a sum and you're computing the ijk coefficient, you would just loop through here and get the ijk coefficient and then add all the results. Similarly for scalar multiple. And then maybe you would call it a day after doing that. My, my part of the presentation is actually done. 
Are there any other questions? You had uh, the parent class. Is there a similar child or parent method? Is there a similar child method to tell you all the inherited classes of a of a class? Yeah. So, for example, um, actually, I forget whether show structure takes arguments, but we have this function called show structure. What if I give it an argument like vector? I have no idea whether this will work. Oh, yeah. Oh, this, oh, this gives the parents a vector. So, no, we don't have it the other way. But, you could, but if you type that same command without an argument, then you get the, a display of the entire tree of parents. And you can just find your thing. Here are the um, types of expressions, for example. And um, maybe we see a, our, there's R. Um, <laughs> R is, yeah, so there, if we uh, look at ring element, every element of a, every particular ring turns out to more generally be a ring element. And so if we make some more rings, and do that show structure command again, I think we'll see some more interesting things up there. Yeah, ring element. So there are three rings, every element of which is also a, a ring element. So um, we didn't organize that in any sort of uh, programmable way, but at least you can get the output visually and see. If you look at the top of this tree, um, you see that at the very top is a type called thing. Thing is the unique type whose parent is itself. And the idea there is that everything in the system is a thing. And there's nothing about things. Um, oh, you could define a function to act on things. I mean, th there are functions that take arguments of type thing, meaning they'll, they'll, you can do anything with them. For example, anything could be a subscript. So you just say, I'm gonna, this function I'm writing could accept something of class thing. But then at the... Um, the children, rather than the grandchildren, of thing would be the most basic data types in the system. And basic list would be an example of one. And the expressions of type sum and product, as well as the things um, with the braces that Mike was showing you, are examples of basic lists. And anyway, you can have fun browsing this stuff and see what all this stuff is. And then here we see some mathematics actually coming in with um, various types of ring. Can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. So uh, can you give us some like basic best practices for programming in Macaulay 2? For instance, like you defined three rings. Because I've used Macaulay 2 before, I could guess that the last one that you defined is the one that it's going to think I'm using. But then this is a like this is a common pitfall that I noticed that I mistake they make this mistake often when I switch rings and try to do some computation and then there's no method for the variables I'm using because it was in a previous ring. Can you just like say a few like why you use parentheses, not parentheses, and maybe like how to make sure that you're working in the ring that you want to be working in, some of these kind of All right. I'll say a few words and we can follow up on that if I don't say completely enough. One thing about Macaulay 2 is that there is no notion of something like the ring in which you are currently working. The concept just doesn't exist. That was true in Macaulay 1. There was a ring in which you're currently working. But in Macaulay 2, um, we've, you know, I created these various rings. What were they? They had variables t and u and x, and then r was, um, I forget what r was. What was r? r had a through e. Now, in this case, the three rings have variable names that don't overlap with each other. So if you type A, then you'll get an element of R. If you type U, T, you'll get an element of that one that mentioned T. And was, was the other one X? Yeah, the other one was X. So these rings haven't interfered with each other at all. And the reason is that their names of their variables are disjoint sets. So one um, good practice, if you want to avoid getting confused, is to not use rings with overlapping names of variables. However, suppose you really, really want to do that. 
then um, you might, here, let's say that A is um, the ring on the previous line. Um, let's say A is the class of X. So that's our polynomial ring, QQX. And let's say B is going to be QQ of XY. And now if we say X plus Y, then we'll get something in B, which is as expected. And if we say X, we're not going to get something in A, even though that was the only thing in X. Now what happened here is that the symbol, whose name is X, got assigned a value, and the value was an element of that ring. Now if you want to go back to using the other ring, then there's this way of going back. And then if you type X, you get an element of A. And if you type um, X plus Y, you get expected pair to have a method. And that's probably the sort of thing you have been running into, where you have rings with overlapping names of variables. So the, um, I, can, I think the, all I can recommend is that um, if you're writing packaged functions that create, that create rings for temporary use, then you try to strive to keep, uh, have those rings use local variables as their names of their variables so that it doesn't interfere with what else you're doing and hide that, and then we can teach you how to do that. And if really you want all those variables there and you want to use them all, you should just have disjoint sets or you should just use the use command to recall the particular ring you want to work with. So what usually happens to me is that I do a quotient ring and then the variables are naturally the same as the names are the same as the ring I started with. Yeah, that's right. And so there you can't really you don't really have the option of using disjoint sets of variables, but you could use the use command to switch back and forth between the ring and its quotient ring. What the use command did was it looked at the ring A, looked at the names of its variables, and assigned those symbols in the language values which are the corresponding elements of the ring. So if we would hit use B right now, then the X variable would now be instantiated from the ring B. Or That's right. But of course, another thing you could do is to just refer to the generators of the ring anonymously by their number. Can we talk about parentheses a little bit? What's the question about parentheses? Well, I notice you often don't use parentheses, but then sometimes you have a function with two arguments, and maybe you do use parentheses, and then... What are you finding a function? So are, are you saying that f equals um, x arrow something like um, x plus 3, and g equals parenthesis x arrow x plus 5? So g Is that your question? Y, then I would do G equals X comma Y goes to yeah. Oops. Wrong button. Yeah, so these are various ways of defining functions. And so um, there is a slight difference between what you see on line 53 and what you see on line 54. The difference is only that a G We'll insist on getting just one argument. Sorry, the, the previous G. Let's bring back the previous G. Suppose I try that with two arguments. Then it says expected one argument but got two. Whereas the F is really a little bit too specific for the purpose of this demo, I think. But let me just try to answer it briefly. The F um, will accept the two arguments and give an error later on. So the only point of having an argument without parentheses around it is if you want to be able to accept a sequence as the argument. And for example, because you want to deal with a variable number of arguments. I think that's the point. It looks like it's accepting three fours as, as the x, like the list three fours. That's right. X is the sequence. And but you don't know the length in advance. It could be length 100. And then you might want to do something with every member of the sequence. For instance, you can type f space 3, right? And then f eats 3 and gives you the result, right? With no parentheses, right? f space 3. Yeah, so here the parentheses are completely irrelevant. They're only relevant when defining the function. Elsewhere, 
in expressions that get evaluated, the parentheses are used solely for grouping. There's no, yeah, maybe that's what the deal is that you're really questioning, which is that in Macaulay 2, when you have a function applied to an argument, the parentheses are optional. In fact, what's happening in Macaulay 2 is that it's parsed in the following way. You have an expression, and you have an expression, and you just have a space in between. And so space is one of the basic operators in Macaulay 2, and you can install methods for it. You can decide that. Um, here, I'll illustrate that. So 3, 4. The default method for when there's a function, a space, and a thing is to apply the function to the thing. There is no default method for what to do when you have an integer, a space, and an integer. So you could feel free to define that to be something you want. You could define it to multiply, for example. Then you wouldn't have to type all those pesky stars anymore. So which order are these things evaluated then? Just the Left or right. If the questions have died down, I can let Mike have the last eight minutes, and he can show you something about I sure function. Okay. Uh, about your example before with the tensor product, because I, before you were doing it, I was thinking that maybe you would like to define a new product class instead, like the tensor product class, and define. Yeah. In fact, that was my first version of the demo. I had. Oh no, I didn't have a new tensor product. Well. Anyway, you could do that. So how do you define a new class? This is actually an important point. So let me touch upon it. You've seen that we have these things called classes. And you've seen that there seem to be a lot of them. And so we must have a way of making them. Well, you can make them too. So for example, suppose you want tensor product of vectors to be a, a class and you want to do something with it. So what you can do is you can say tensor product should be a new type of basic list. And then you could say new tensor product from a, a pair of vectors. And uh, now, you're, now you're starting to get going. So you have a new type of list, and you can start doing something with it. Now, the reason I took basic list instead of list is because I don't want to inherit all the methods that apply to list. For example, one of the methods that applies to list is that a number times a list is the list of products where you multiply the number times every entry of the list. And if I had said tensor product equals new type of list, then if you would type two times, here, let's illustrate that. Two times that thing is, um, there's no method, that's good. We're gonna implement that. That's what you have to implement. But if I had said, um, list instead of basic list. Basic list, by the way, is the parent of list. Then um, if I do all this stuff again, <coughs> then it has a very sad consequence. So you have to be careful about the inheritance. But yes, you can make new types, new classes, and you can make them print out the way you like. This might be the way to play around with yeah, but now, so the idea of uh, showing you about expressions was that we already do have this whole facility, the objects of class expression, which are designed to hold expressions in unevaluated form. And in fact, that facility is used extensively in assembling things for printing. So, uh, why wouldn't you inherit it from expression rather than? That's, yeah, that's a, oh, that's in fact a better idea if we want it to be part of that. And maybe there's a particular type of expression it should inherit. <coughs> I think Anton's suggestion is really an excellent one. Because um, the way expression defi is defined is expression is just a new type of basic list. That's how we defined expression in the system. And so now, if we do it this way and do show structure, <coughs> and somewhere up there, we will see our new tensor. There it is. Tensor product has now been added to the bottom of the list of all the things of whose parent is expression. And so whatever applies to expression will get applied to that. And actually, this is really, this is really a very good idea. Because um, um, if we, um, where did I make the thing? 
Oh, yeah, we have to go back. Uh, yeah, let's make one of these, and now let's see what happens with two times it. So what happened there is that because we inherited from expression, we got the facility for expressions inherited. And the facility for expressions means that a number times an expression is converted to an expression in unevaluated form. In this case, it's a product. And if we would peek into it, nope. not so good. Oh, also not so good. Yes, up to four. <laughs> you see that if you peek, it's a product. So it's really a very good suggestion. Yes? I have one more question about the brackets. So you can now... Do you mean the braces? No, no, no. No, the, the, no, no. the question before that Luke asked also about, about having normal brackets. And In parentheses? Parentheses, yes. So um, if you just type 1 plus 2 times 3, and this will obviously hopefully not be evaluated from left to right, but this the multiplication of numbers should come first, and then you add... Oh, of course. There's, there's parsing precedence. That's right. But the 2 times 3 is evaluated after the 1. So, okay, well, it doesn't matter. So you switch it and it doesn't matter. So that's, that was, that was my point. So can you somehow specify, I mean, you can define all your own operators. For example, the space, we can actually define what the space means. The parsing precedence of operators is all predefined. It's all predefined. And it's documented. And um, let's see, where is, I think it's documented under something you could reach. Let's see, maybe operators or something like that. Oh, there we go, precedence of operators. Yeah, so here is, here is the table that shows what parsing precedence the various operators have. That's predefined. There's no way to adjust it. So spaces in that list, uh, spaces and operators, you said. Yeah, let's move down a bit. There it is. Yeah, I was going to trip it up a little bit. Transpose m underscore 1 times under, uh, underscore 2, and knowing what that's going to do, for instance. Yeah, so maybe you print out this table, and then you'll see <laughs> how everything works. <laughs> one could also use parentheses. Yes, one could use parentheses, but how does one know when? Because you don't really want to clutter the page for the reader of your code with all sorts of unnecessary parentheses. So you really want to eliminate every single parenthesis that's not absolutely needed. <laughs> Time is coming to a close. We have only two seconds left. So maybe let's uh, thank Dan. Oh. <laughs>